All right, so I think we're going to get started. Um, so thanks everyone for coming. Um, so yeah, first of all, since there's some new people here, I think, just to let you guys know, we're Students for Liberty. We meet every week here at this time in this room. Um, we're a Libertarian Club. We have generally discussions on political topics every week, and we also have speaker events like this about once a month. So uh, if you're interested, we'll be passing around our sign-up sheet, sign up for our email list. Um, so yeah, if you like what you hear, feel free to sign up. Um, also, after tonight, after the meeting, we'll be having a social at, on Northside, so everyone's welcome to come to that. Um, okay, so yeah, with that, I'm going to introduce our speaker. Um, so, Dr. Sharon Presley is a Cal alumni who received her bachelor's degree from here from Berkeley in the 1960s. Uh, during her time at Berkeley, she was active in the free speech movement and knew Mario Savio personally. Uh, she founded two political groups, uh, first the Cal Conservatives for Political Action uh, in 1964, and then the Alliance for Libertarian Activists in 1966, which is one of the first overtly libertarian groups in the modern movement. Um, she went on to co-found the influential libertarian bookstore Laissez-Faire Books uh, in 1972, and also co-founded the Association of Libertarian Feminists in 1976, where she currently serves as the national coordinator. Um, Dr. Presley received her PhD in social psychology from the City University of New York Graduate Center, where she wrote her dissertation on political resistors to authority. Uh, she recently retired from teaching psychology and critical thinking courses at Cal State uh, East Bay in Hayward. And her research specialties are on obedience and resistance to authority, and res women resistors to authority and other gender issues. Um, Dr. Presley is the co-editor of Exquisite. Exquisite Rebel, the essays of Voltaire de Clare, published in 2005. Um, the book won an American Library Association Choice Award for Outstanding Academic Title in 2005. Uh, Dr. Presley's most recent book on dealing with authority, called Standing Up to Experts and Authority, How to Avoid Being Intimidated, Manipulated, and Abused, which was published on May 5th, 2010. And she is currently working on an anthology of American women resistors to authority in the 19th century. Um, so the title of the talk tonight is Government is, uh, Government is Women's Enemy, Voluntary Association and Mutual Aid are Women's Friends. Um, so yeah, with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Sharon Presley. Thank you very much. And it's always nice to return to the scene of the crime uh, here at Berkeley. I was at dinner regaling them with stories in my memories of the free speech movement and other things going on. Um, and my version is somewhat different than Ayn Rand's. But then I was here and she was not. Um, and if you twist my arm, I'll tell you some stories uh, about when Rand came to campus later. <clears throat> I'd like to start from an early twenty uh, quote quoting an early 20th century libertarian feminist named Suzanne LaFaller. Anybody here heard of her? Well, I'm working on getting her book concerning women reprinted. Um, <clears throat> it was published in 1926. At that time, she wrote, no system of government can hope long to survive the cynical disregard of both law and principle which government in America regularly exhibits. Under these circumstances, no legal guarantee of rights is worth the paper that is written on, and the women who rely upon such guarantees to protect them against prejudice and demonstrate uh, di discrimination are leaning on a broken reed. It was in 1926. Have things gotten any better? We all know the answer to that. <clears throat> now, before I launch into the main part of what I want to say, uh, I thought I would describe what a libertarian feminist is, because I'm not sure everybody understands that term. They have feminism, but we won't go there. Um, since I'm here as a representative of the Association of Libertarian Feminists. Now, what all feminists have in common uh, is the belief that the political economic, uh, a belief in the political, economic, and social equality of the sexes. That's the, de the definition in the dictionary. And, and I think m most feminists would agree on that. And I don't find that particularly controversial, although 
I must say on Facebook there are people who seem to have a problem with the term feminism, but we won't talk about that right now. Um, <clears throat> is feminism is essentially about viewing women as individuals, free of stereotypical ideas of what women should be. Feminism is basically saying, let us alone to be what we want to be, not what you think we should be. So feminists, I think all feminists, want women to be free, free of the domination of men, free to control their bodies and psyches as they want to, free to make their own decisions about their own lives, independent of the course of domination of others. Okay, so far, I don't think any of that is controversial in a libertarian uh, setting. The problem is that many feminists, um, and I think because they're naive about government, and naive about the issue of patriarchy in government, do I think that the state can and should help women. However, I do want to point out that there's a long history of feminists who were wary of the state. There's an excellent book written by the late Joan Kennedy Taylor, who was for many years the national coordinator of ALP. The book Reclaiming the Mainstream, um, Rediscovering Individualist Feminism. Uh, she writes about some of the history of individualist feminism in her book. And also Wendy McElroy has done a number of anthologies highlighting women who were wary of the state. So it's not like we're some kind of aberration. Um, there, in fact, many of the women that I'm writing about in the book I'm currently working on were wary of the state. Not necessarily libertarians, although certainly some of them were, but they were wary of the state. The abolitionists, the sex radicals, the free thinkers, and the suffragists, and of course the anarchists. Anarchists are often blanked out from history, even women's history. Most people, and I have read dozens of books on women's history at this point. The almost the only one who ever gets consistently mentioned is Emma Goldman. Only one or two regular histories ever mentioned Walter and Claire or any of the others. I'm going to correct that in my book. Okay. So, what's different about libertarian feminism? Uh, Lynn Kinsky and I wrote a discussion paper back in the 1970s, which is on the ALP website. I hope you all got a handout uh, talking about uh, our uh, our website and the URL. The URL is really easy, alf.org. We got it back in the 90s, late 90s, ha ha ha, before the Animal Liberation Front and various other things. <laughs> so, at any rate, that you can find a bunch of stuff there. So, um, we, we write that while rejecting, rejecting patriarchal attitudes and dominating ways of interacting on a personal level, some feminists fail to reject it on a political level. They're still willing to use the power of that most patriarchal of institutions, the state or government, to get what they want. Yet turning to the government just changes the sort of oppression that women face, not the fact Instead of being oppressed by, uh, as, uh, as mothers, wives, or women, we become oppressed as taxpayers because somebody has to pay for all of those programs. Um, turning to the government to solve our problems just replaces oppressors by uh, patriarchs we know, father, husband, boss, with oppression by patriarchs we don't know the hordes of government bureaucrats uh, incessantly prying ever into every nook and cranny of our lives and often in senseless ways as I will discuss later and we're paying the price for it. 
Now, some of the things that I'm going to mention tonight as examples uh, include root, uh, rigid and unnecessarily, unnecessary, unnecessary zoning restrictions on child care centers that make affordable child care uh, more inaccessible. A public, oh, well, I'm not actually going to talk about education. I'll uh, have um, abortion and contraception. Oh, I'm going to have a lot to say about reproductive freedom. And I'm going to also talk about the issue of welfare and poverty. Now, there are many other issues we could talk about, but I know I don't have enough time. You'll have to invite me back for part two. Okay. Um, now, does government ever help women? Of course it does. It would be silly to deny it. But I think overall in the long run, it's one step forward and two steps back. Because there are many ways government does harm women. And I think it's also important to keep in mind that what the state pays for, it controls. And who gets to go do the controlling? You and me? Uh -uh. Bureaucrats in Washington uh, who are perhaps often more interested in protecting their cushy jobs than in helping the people. And I also would like to make it clear that are the kinds of changes that many libertarians, including myself, might like to see come about, they can't happen. We cannot throw people out on the street. That's ridiculous. Um, what we have to do is work toward a time when public programs won't be necessary at all. Because as I'm going to try to demonstrate, private programs cost less and work better. So the first example I want to talk about is reproductive freedom. This is an obvious area where government has harmed women in the past and has a great potential to harm women in the very near future. Um, abortion was actually legal in the United States from uh, the time of the earliest settlers. Um, about the, at the time the Constitution uh, was adopted, the criteria Criterion was quickening. We first could feel something growing. And so abortions were very common um, and even advertised. But because of the pressure of the churches, anti-immigration fears, and the professional medical associations who didn't want any competition, for instance, with midwifery, uh, abortion became illegal in the late 1800s. A lot of complicated reasons. The culture became less libertarian and more rigidified in the 1800s. Um, and by uh, 1965, all 50 states banned abortion, with some exceptions which varied from state to state, but save the life of the mother, case of rape or incest, or if the fetus was deformed. Depends on the state. Now, Criminalization of abortion didn't stop, didn't really reduce the numbers of women who uh, sought abortions. In the years before Roe versus Wade, the estimates of illegal abortions ranged as high as 1.2 million a year. You need to know that. But not always done by qualified doctors. In the 1960s, right here on campus, we had a button that says, no more coat hangers legalize abortion. A lot of women died. Um, now, as I'm sure you all know, in 1973, uh, the Supreme Court declared uh, most existing abortion laws unconstitutional. And it ruled out any interference in the first trimester of pregnancy and put limits on what restrictions should be passed in abortion. Well, you might say, well, so the state came through. Ah, but what the state giveth, the state can take away. And right now, the rabid right <laughs> is trying to erode our reproductive freedoms. And they're well on their way. Let me tell
tell you what's happened in the last few years. Uh, in 1976, only three years after the Supreme Court, uh, the Congress adopted the first Hyde Amendment, barring the use of federal Medicaid funds to provide abortion to low-income women. Whatever you think of government programs, this is ideological discrimination. And it hurt low-income women who had no other access to abortion. In 1977, a revised Hyde Amendment was passed, allowing states to deny Medicaid uh, funding, except in cases of rape, incest, or, quote, severe and long-lasting damage to the uh, woman's physical health. Okay. Then in 1991, Supreme Court decision Rust versus Sullivan upheld the constitutionality of the 1988 gag rule, which prohibits doctors and counselors at clinics which receive federal funding from providing their patients with information about and referrals for abortion. How many of you knew that? Okay. Yeah. Okay, they can't even talk about it. Wait. That'll get worse. Okay. In 1992, um, through uh, Planned Parenthood of Southeastern Pennsylvania versus Casey, it, okay, it did reaffirm the core holdings of Roe that women have a right to abortion before fetal viability, but it still allows states to restrict abortion access so long as these restrictions do not impose a quote unquote undue burden on women seeking abortions, whatever that means. In fact, I would argue that restrictions do place an undue burden. Uh, and I'll talk about that more in a moment. In 2000, the Food and Drug Administration approved the use of RU486 um, as an option in abortion care for early pregnancy. That's the morning after pill. Um, but this is busy being eroded by appointees from the Bush era. In 2003, a federal ban on so-called partial birth abortion procedures was passed by Congress and signed into law by President Bush. The National Abortion Federation immediately challenged the law in court and was successful in blocking enforcement of the law for its members. Then came the Supreme Court decision in uh, Gonzalez versus Carhartt in 2007. It upheld a ban on, quote, intact dilation and extraction, unquote, intact DNC. Um, that's basically the partial birth uh, uh, abortion that the opponents have sensationalized. And this ban called for two year jail sentences, and a $250,000 fine for performing intact DNC. Now, in fact, the procedure is used very infrequently, and only in cases of medical necessity. But now, physicians have to use more risky procedures instead when it is medically necessary. Um, uh, and not because a woman wants to abort the fetus, but because it's medically necessary. Uh, problems with the way uh, the fetus is developing, uh, so forth. And the political now it's a political decision instead of a medical decision. Um, the court has put its own judgment above uh, appropriate medical practice. Um, over the relevant associations of doctors, including the College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the Planned Parenthood Federation. Bureaucrats are deciding whether women can have this procedure, not medical doctors. Um, <clears throat> in Texas, oh, good old Texas, with a Rick Perry now. Um, <laughs> yeah. Some 500. $5 million previously allocated for family planning services 
was sent instead to crisis pregnancy centers that counsel against abortion and preach abstinence. Oh yeah, that really works, huh? And do not offer contraceptive information or services. Five million dollars got diverted to something that's ideological, not medical. Uh, not to mention Rick Perry's latest trick. How many of you pay attention on Facebook? Huh? For now, they just passed a law that says that before you can get an abortion in Texas, number one, the woman has to look, look at a sonogram, but number two, the doctors are forced to read an anti-abortion polemic to their patients, whether the um, doctors agree or not, or whether the woman wants to hear it. Wait, there's more. This decision, um, Gonzalez versus Carhartt, also legitimized the highly uh, controversial notion of post-abortion syndrome, um, for which no reliable da data exists. That is, and actually I had somebody on my Facebook page just in the last couple of days pull this one. All those women are going to regret this for the rest of their life. And I said, want to match research with me? You'll lose. He didn't like that very much. Because, you know why? Two meta-analyses of the American uh, Psychological Association. How many of you know what a meta-analysis is? Oh, you got to learn that for you. It's an analysis of a whole bunch of studies. Okay, so it's in the new and more sophisticated way of doing a literature review. So you look at all the studies in a particular subject and perform a statistical analysis. Okay, okay. Well, at any rate, they did a study, and what they found, the majority of women who had abortions not only did not regret their decision, they were satisfied and glad they did it. Not everybody, honestly but the majority. So if anyone ever tells you that most women regret their abortions, you tell them they don't know what they're talking about. And feel free to be ruder than that if you want, I don't mind. Um, but it's not true. The American Psychological Association did two different studies finding the same thing. The latest one was in 2006. Um, okay, now, because of things that are happening, contraception is in danger. Uh, I hope you all know that contraception was essentially illegal until the 60s with the Griswold versus Connecticut decision. Um, Bush appointed a totally unqualified man named Hager to the FDA committee that deals with such issues. The other panelists on that committee thought he was an idiot, but he was, in, he was appointed to head the committee. Um, so in 1924, because of this, I mean, I'm sorry, in 2004, because of this guy, the FDA went against its own advisors and scientists based on Hager's irrelevant and unsubstantiated claims and declined to make a plan involving the morning after pill uh, over the counter. So as of now, you can only get RU486 for, with a doctor's prescription. And what does that mean? That means that poor women who don't have access to doctors, or actually, the ones who get hurt the most are the ones that are sort of in between. Welfare, maybe they can get it. People with good insurance, they can get it the lower middle class women or students who maybe don't have really good medical coverage. Can't get it. Okay. Now, um, and here's what's really scary. Some researchers think that there's a chance that the Supreme Court, thanks to Scalia and Thomas, may re reverse Roe versus Wade. Okay by determining that the right to privacy is not guaranteed by the Constitution. How many of you know that Roe versus Wade was based on the idea that the Constitution uh, gives people and women the right to privacy in their personal lives? Okay. 
Well, that may be in danger. A lot of legal scholars think so. You want to know why? There were con the rabid conservatives, and I'm not including every conservative in that. I'm prefacing it with the rabid conservatives. Um, they're trying out all these abortion laws. They want them to get to the Supreme Court. And they're keeping their fingers crossed. Right now, the Supreme Court divides up 50-50, except for one person who, whose vote is not certain. I did know his name. I forget it. Anybody know? Anthony Kennedy. Pardon? Anthony Kennedy. Kennedy, OK. I'm not sure which way he'll go, but the rest, well, on one side and the other. So our reproductive freedom hinges on one person. We don't know which way it's going to work. Um, and wait, there's more. Before I change topics. The rabid right wants the state to do even more. How many of you have heard of the Stupak bill? Or um, the more recent one from Chris Smith, the Republican from New Jersey. Let me tell you about that. Here's what the Washington Post said. Fe federal law already prohibits federal dollars from being used to finance abortions, except for pregnancies that are the result of rape or incest or situations in which the life of the mo mother is in danger. But the vague legislation brought to you by Representative Chris Smith in New Jersey and 173 co sponsors would bar folks from using the health savings account to pay for an abortion, and they could not, and then they can forget about availing themselves of tax credits or deductions for medical expenses for an abortion, unquote. Translated, that means legislating private insurance. They have gone beyond the legislation for women on welfare. Now they're trying to legislate private insurance. But the Washington Post goes on to say, quote, the scary part is when federal funding of abortion would be allowed. It has to be forcible rape. Got that? Forcible rape. Excuse me? What other kind of rape is there? The very definition of rape is forcible. Sexual conduct. What this in fact means, it's a code word for making it even more difficult for these poor women to get abortions. They would have to prove it was forcible, not in a court of law, but to bureaucrats. And have, what, if, what if you get raped um, from taking, uh, because you've been administered date rape drugs? Okay? How are you going to prove force? It's not going to be any bruises. So if you don't have bruises and broken bones, how do you prove to these bureaucrats that it was forceful? It's obviously a cynical ploy to make it even more difficult for women to get abortion. Clearly, the libertarian tradition is one of non-intervention in the affairs of others and protection of the sovereignty of the individual. Uh, where what, whatever one's personal preferences or qualms about these various issues of reproductive freedom, um, as, as with what qualms one might have about drug use, the libertarian position on abortion is clearly one of no state or legal intervention. That is the alternative. And by the way, I, I may have forgotten to mention, uh, I know I did, that the uh, contraception and abortion are both based on the right to privacy. If the Supreme Court rules that the Constitution doesn't guarantee the right to privacy in personal matters, the states can not only start whittling away abortion rights for contraception too, and don't think it won't happen. Now, there are other, another area where government laws harm uh, women. It's related to marriage. 
In the 19th century, anarchist feminists Voltaire and Clare and others wrote about the oppression of government laws that made women into chattel slaves in marriage. I hope you all know that. Basically, in the 1800s, most of the 1800s, once women got married, they had no rights. They had no rights to their own money. They had an inheritance that came before they got married. Once they got married, the husband could control it. If they got divorced, which of course was very rare, but if they did, the husband got custody of the kids. The women who got married had no rights. So it's not surprising that whole terrain referred to it as sex slavery. Okay. In the early 20th century, libertarian feminist Suzanne Follett, and you can learn a little bit about her, by the way, at the website of the Association of Libertarian Feminists. I wrote an essay in the 1970s about her. Um, she declared that the government should get out of marriage altogether. It should be a private contract. You know, I, I suspect I'm not going to get a lot of argument from libertarians. Um, now, but a lot of feminists, now uh, some feminists, <coughs> other kinds of feminists made that argument too, and certainly have written about the unknown uh, baggage that you agree to when you get a marriage license. Um, but it is libertarian feminists and anarchist feminists who are most consistently raising the question, should the state be involved in the uh, institution of marriage? Uh, it is, after all, an essentially private relationship. Now, there are many ways that um, marriage laws harm women. I'm going to concentrate here on tax and business laws. Um, I'm indebted to economist Veronique de Rougy of the Mercatus Center for the following analysis. I know some of you know who she is. She's written some good stuff for reason also. There are many government policies that limit women's ability to choose the lives they want. Um, you might ask the question, does the government support a woman's decision to work? Not if the woman is married, makes less than her spouse, and the government's file, uh, the couples file their taxes jointly. Uh, in that case, the government <coughs> taxes the first dollar the wife earns at her husband's highest marginal tax rate, not at the rate the wife's salary warrants. Anybody here knew that? Uh huh. Okay. This marriage penalty creates a disincentive for women to work unless they're going to make the same amount or more than their husbands. Okay. To add insult to injury, while many working uh, mothers would uh, prefer to work part-time, almost two-thirds of them work full-time. The tax on the money uh, they earn is just too high to make part-time work uh, feasible. Okay, let's talk about tax credits. <clears throat> Women own 40% of closely held businesses, a majority of which are very small. According to the National Federation of Independent Business, high tax rates disproportionately penalize those entrepreneurs because many small business owners tend to file their business income through personal income tax. High tax rates mean lower business and personal income and less ability to help um, get work at, uh, help at home. Even, even some regulations needed to protect women can produce bad outcomes. Aside from no protective labor legislation, but that's an old one. For uh, instance, government mandates that employers must approve extended maternity leaves, make hiring women of childbearing age less appealing to employers. As a result, women are more likely to be unemployed or to see their pay limited whether they have children or not. Derouchy goes on to declare that government intervention makes women dependent. Um, after fighting so hard for their independence, many women find themselves relying on 
government payouts and are less prepared to face adversity. She says, uh, for example, consider Social Security. Women depend on Social Security more than men. Uh, based um, on Social Security data, almost 29% of women over age 65 rely on Social Security for 90% of their retirement income. The numbers increased to 46% for unmarried elderly women. What's the problem? Social Security is, of course, of the whim of the government. And if any of you read some of the Cato papers, you know what's wrong with Social Security. Okay? It's a house of cards. So, depending on Social Security payments makes women vulnerable to changes in government policy. At any time, Congress can reduce benefits even for women who paid their entire lives into the system. Frankly, it doesn't look like it's right around the corner right now. Um, in a sense, it did that in 2009 by saying Social Security recipients wouldn't get a cost of living increase that year. Okay. It's starting to creep in. De Rigi argues that uh, women, uh, government has difficulty distinguishing which programs aid women and which don't. In short, women would be better off if governments didn't discriminate based on marital or parental status, gender, or age. And if it reduced regulations on businesses and dependency on government programs. Okay. Then another point she makes is about immigration. And immigration policies also hurt working moms. Working mothers would benefit from having additional and affordable help at home. According to Patricia Cortez of the University of Chicago and Jose Tosada of the Brookings Institution, an increase in the supply of low-skilled immigrants would allow women to work longer hours, make more money, and also allow these women just spend less time doing housework and spend more time with their families when they aren't working. And of course, it would also, uh, eased immigration would also help the immigrant women. They're coming to the United States because they want a better life for them and their children. That's the main reason immigrants come to the United States. And even a low-wage job is better than what they had where they came. Okay. Now, what about government programs designed to help working moms? Some feminists think this is just what's needed, but only if you think it's okay to have a paternalistic state, what government funds and controls. The government projects dealing with such issues as childcare, national health insurance, and, and education all involve quote unquote national standards i.e. control. This means government bureaucrats in Washington decide what is best for you. If I were to ask most people whether they or bureaucrats could decide, uh, uh, would be good at deciding uh, for them, most would say, well, of course, I, I can, I'm better than some bureaucrat at deciding what's best for me. But somehow, Many people seem to think it's okay to have bureaucrats decide for everyone else. It doesn't work that way, does it? The bureaucrats decide for everybody. I want to talk specifically about daycare. It's been known for a long time, and Cato research has uh, reinforced to even, uh, even more over the years, that government regulations concerning daycare, including rigid and unnecessary zoning restrictions of, of child care centers, uh, make affordable daycare even more inaccessible to working moms and more expensive. Advocates of increased government involvement in daycare generally argue that one, there's a shortage of care, child care facilities. Uh, two, that the facilities that do exist are not affordable. And three, unregulated, day, unregulated daycare is harmful to children. But it's not true. It's very wrong headed. 
First of all, it was a national daycare home study conducted uh, for the Department of Health and Human Services. It found no indication that unregulated daycare was either harmful or dangerous to children. The daycare facilities are, are subject to a host of local zoning, building, health, fire, and safety statutes. These regulations vary from state to state and municipality to municipality can dictate everything from the time a facility opens to the width of the door. Oh, yeah. um, the intent of these regulations is to ensure minimum health and safety standards for the children and to guarantee responsible care by the daycare provider. Unfortunately, many of the requirements do little to achieve these aims while a because they're more about the physical concrete facility than about what is actually going on in the quality of the daycare because it's a lot easier to regulate the physical environment. Um, a major effect of these regulations has been to raise the cost of daycare of services, driving providers underground and limiting the number of children who benefit. Unnecessary regulations are stifling the supply of daycare at a time when the need, need has never been greater and show every sign of continuing to surge. There are many women who are mothers themselves who have chosen to stay home with their own children and they supplement their family's income or sometimes actually support their families by uh, caring for the children of uh, women, uh, women who work outside the home. The added expense of bureaucratic red tape can easily tip the balance to, um, uh, for home providers uh, turning a marginal profit um, in a rewarding endeavor into a frustrating and expensive nightmare. Clearly then, if uh, the supply of daycare is to keep pace with the demand, it's essential that there be a favorable climate for its growth present time was not, and the regulatory obstacle course laid out by state and local officials is in large part why. Now, let me talk a little bit about state barriers to the provision of daycare. Most, or, or city, city zoning commissions consider daycare to be a small business and often prohibit programs from opening up in residential areas. The prohibition extends even to individuals wishing to use their own homes to care for a few neighborhood children. The absurdity of this restrictive zoning policy was pointed out by one frustrated would-be provider uh, before the Washington, D.C. Board of Zoning Adjustment. Quote, you're telling us that we cannot operate a daycare facility in a residentially zoned middle class neighborhood with a large number of working mothers, but we can operate a center in a commercial zone between two topless bars. <laughs> By um, increasing providers' costs, daycare regulations limit the supply of a much needed service. Many regulations, especially local zoning and building codes, do little to provide quality. Um, or ensure safety. Even in cases where regulations might benefit the child's welfare, limited enforcement minimizes its positive effects. What Cater suggests is uh, a po one possibility. The states could replace licensing laws with a system of registration for both home and centers. Registration requirements would include not only um, those that have proven effective uh, on quality of care, uh, on health and safety, and uh, these would not be so costly that they uh, could cause providers uh, to operate illegally. At the same time, state and child advocacy groups could continually reassess standards to de determine which serve children's interests best in the context of providers and parents' willingness and ability to pay. So it's, it's a measure that's in a better direction. Unlike licensing,
licensing registration would give parents the ultimate responsibility for the quality of their children's daycare. This is appropriate since it's the parents who come into contact with the daycare center staff and observe the facility at least twice a day. Parents are in the best position to uh, monitor daycare homes and uh, centers effectively. Uh, complaints by parents could then serve the basis for official action. Now, okay, so the state has made a mess of daycare, made it much more expensive and less of it. Let's move to another area where it's often said, we must have the state. What about social services, um, including the aid of dependent children and the welfare? And I mention those because they, those issues affect women um, more than men, in greater numbers than men. Liberals say that welfare and such services have to be done through government tax money because Americans are selfish and won't help those in need. First of all, it's not true. Americans are more generous than any other country. They give more to private charity than any other country. And funny thing, it's the liberals who are stingier, not conservatives. In the book, Who Really Cares, <laughs> written by Arthur Brooke, Brooke cites statistics to show that conservatives give a much greater percentage of their income at every income level from rich, poor to rich, than liberals do. Now, I'm going to study and look at the parity. But, anyway. but okay, conservatives are often the women boys, right? But they give more than liberals do overall. <laughs> Here's a clue as to why. This is very interesting from Brooke's book. There, he also found a correlation between beliefs about government versus private responsibility. In 1996, a large sample of Americans were asked to respond to the statement: the government has a responsibility to reduce income equality, inequality, unquote. 43% of respondents disagreed with the statement, 33% agreed. Those who disagreed were significantly more likely to give to charity than those who agreed. Um, they gave away, on average, four times as much money per year. The people who believed in individual responsibility. Um, of people expressing the strongest feelings, those who disagreed strongly with the statement that government has a responsibility to reduce income inequality gave an average of 12 times more than those who agreed strongly. Those great humanitarians, the liberals, want somebody else to do it. They don't want to do it. Okay, the problem with modern welfare it takes away responsibility, it treats people as helpless children, uh, ties them up with mountains of red tape and bureaucracy and costs them, and it costs more than private efforts and gets less results. But other than that, no problem, huh? Okay, since 1965, more than three trillion dollars has been spent uh, uh, through state and local governments. Uh, 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 let me start over again. Uh, since uh, 1965, more than th 13 trillion dollars has been spent on the so-called war on poverty, with state and local governments laying out another couple of trillion. This year alone, federal welfare spending will exceed 600 billion to fund 122 separate anti-poverty programs. All those programs and all that money have do, done little to take people out of poverty. If anything, there's more poverty now than in 1965. In fact, I think I just saw a recent article that said one is six or supposedly four. All that money and Americans here even four. Perhaps something's wrong. Now, Interestingly enough, in regard to welfare, even Marion Barry, former mayor of Washington, D.C., who's now a councilman representing one of the poorest 
areas of Washington says, welfare, quote, enslaves residents in joblessness and dependency in the government rather than lifting them up and giving them an opportunity to achieve self-sufficiency, end quote. And this guy is not a conservative or let alone a libertarian. What people need are programs that help them gain control over their lives so that they can help themselves, not programs to keep them in perpetual dependency. Um, there is a vast literature from social psychology, my specialty, um, that show that people do better in all kinds of ways when they feel in control of their life. How many of you had psychology courses? Internal locus of control, that's the term psychologists use. Um, having an internal locus of control has enormous benefits uh, for a person, including decreasing any feelings of learned helplessness, increases ability to act on its own, increases feelings of self-worth and efficacy. These programs destroy it. What are the alternatives? How are we going to do it if the state doesn't do it? Because we certainly need backups to help uh, people who, through no fault of their own, or, or even people trying to better themselves after making poor choices. We, there needs to be programs to help these people. Uh, most Americans would agree with that. Nobody, very few people want to turn people out of the street and say, tough luck. But do we need a system that spends 70 cents of every dollar on the infrastructure of bureaucrats, social workers, and buildings, and only 30 cents in the poor. Those are the staff. 70% for the infrastructure, 30% for the poor. No private charity has that kind of overhead, not one. The track record of small private charities, and I do emphasize the small ones. I found out, in doing my research, I found out some interesting things about some of the larger charities. Um, Goodwill and a variety of others have fun, government funded, have a large percentage of their uh, income from government. And that corrupts their programs. It has a distortion effect on the kind of programs they do. But, uh, leaving that aside, so I want to emphasize small private charities do much better than government. For example, strategies to elevate people, step. In Richmond, Virginia's largest ha public housing project, it links poor mothers to services from some 30 local churches and faith-based faith organizations. Offers a wide range of services including mentoring, job training, and welfare to work assistance. Though many of the women have uh, serious obstacles like drug abuse, pregnancy, and disabilities, STEP has achieved a remarkable 70% remarkable job placement rate. There isn't any government job placement program that has a success rate even close. Or St. Martin de Poor's House of Hope in Chicago, who specializes in helping homeless women um, first of all, they have to be drug free before they get their help. Private charities, by the way, put a lot more restrictions on who gets help than government welfare. Okay. It's um, uh, it spends less than seven dollars per person per day compared to twenty-two dollars per person the government funded homeless shelter. Or the Gospel Mission in Washington, um, its drug program, um, nearly two-thirds of the addicts remain drug-free compared to government-supported drug facility just three blocks away with only a 10% success rate, yet the government facility spends 20 times as much um, per client. Just the tip of the iceberg. I could name a lot of others, but how are we doing on time? Uh, we're doing okay. Um, I would um, 
give about 15 minutes or so for oh, okay, um, no problem. questions. But okay. So I guess that's like 10 minutes remaining. Okay, I'll hurry up. Um, okay, so in spite of these efforts, things are bad. Okay, let me just, I want to briefly talk about charity of, of uh, the past. There's been a lot of private charity in the past, some of you may know about it. And the advantage of, for instance, the 19th century charities is that they don't, they didn't treat the poor as victims of circumstance in need of cash and handouts but attended to their moral and spiritual dimensions. Journalist John Stossel said, quote, I once thought that there was too much poverty for private charity to make much of a difference. Now I realize that private charity could do so much more if government hadn't crowded it out. In the 1920s, the last decade before the Roosevelt administration launched its campaign to federalize nearly everything, 30% of American men belong to mutual aid societies, groups of people with similar backgrounds who banded together to help members in trouble. They were especially common among minorities, unquote. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, there's more of a quote. M mutual aid societies paid for doctors, built orphanages, and um, took care of the poor. Parents, uh, neighborhoods, neighbors knew best uh, what neighbors needed. They were uh, better at making judgments about who uh, needed uh, a handout and who needed a kick in the rear. <laughs> they uh, helped the homeless, but administered tough love to the rest. They taught self-sufficiency, unquote. And I think this is an important point there, especially certainly for everybody, but certainly for women. Most, mostly it's male bureaucrats in D.C. deciding what they think women need or, versus local communities of women helping each other, which you think does a better job. Okay. The many women's shelters and women crisis centers are testimony to which is the more reasonable answer. Male cops used to be, and probably still are to some extent, very insensitive to um, victims and treated them badly. Women in the shelters know how to treat other women. Women in their communities understand other women in the community, bureaucrats do. Um, now, David Vito, how many of you are familiar with David Vito in the book Voluntary City? You need to read that if you're libertarians, because it talks about all the services that have actually been provided on a private basis in the past. Not libertarian pie in the sky, bye bye, but actual existing private uh, services. Uh, among the, the least known but most fascinating example were the fraternal hospitals among blacks. Uh, departing from the general pattern of the decline of fraternal societies as the century wore on, many of these hospitals dated from the 1930s and 1940s. Example was the hospital of the Knights and Daughters of Tabor in Mississippi, which between 1942 and 1964 cared for over um, 350,000 patients, many of them sharecroppers. As late as 1964, total dues of $30 per year enabled members to uh, major and minor surgery. Like most black hospitals, it was uh, a low-tech enterprise, which would probably run afoul of current, cer of current certification uh, requirements. But given the great poverty of the members, however, it represented a major achievement. Um, the recollections, recollections of patients indicate that the state, that the staff often showed a missionary zeal, which made uh, up for the many technical shortcomings. And I don't know if I had to be in that situation. I'd rather have people who cared, and maybe you know there were a few problems with the facility. Okay. People in the community helping others in the community, community solidarity. And that, you can find more details about that in Vito's book from, entitled 
uh, from mutual aid to welfare state. Okay, so uh, let me skip, uh, skip ahead to ask the question, will people actually help without coercion? Because of course, the liberals think no, you have to hold the gun to people's head. First of all, like I said before, Americans give more, more to charity than any other country. Furthermore, a number of studies show that as welfare programs go up, private giving goes down, and conversely, when welfare programs go down, private giving goes up. Other suggestions uh, involve allowing people to, declare, to deduct charitable gifts from income tax, even if they don't itemize. Uh, the Price Waterhouse Cooper report indicates that the result would be to increase giving by $14 billion and stimulate 11 million new givers if they could declare deductions without uh, itemizing. Another idea comes from the National Center for Policy Analysis. Uh, provide all taxpayers with a dollar for dollar tax credit to private charitable, for private charitable contributions. The Beacon Hill Institute estimates that this would generate as much as $125 billion per year in additional giving. But, breaking news, what does Obama want to do? Anybody know? He wants to tax charitable contributions. It's in today's news, literally today. I don't know about you, but to me, this seems pretty insane. <laughs> okay? Because it's really clear what would happen. It would decrease private giving and increase demand for government programs that don't work. Okay? Just more social engineering that is rapidly approaching social fascism. And even other Democrats were taken aback by this thing. They, they didn't dare, dare say, Obama's lost his marbles, not the Democrats. <laughs> but they're going, um, well, this does seem a bit, you know, whatever. They, they, even the Democrats are like a bull. Thank you, believe it. Okay, well, I have lots more, but I suspect we're running short on time. So, um... There are, by the way, still existing mutual aid societies, and a lot of libertarian anarchist groups are starting more. If you want to see some examples, because I, I don't have all my notes with me, but go to uh, Libertopia. Do you know about Libertopia? The Lib Libertopia blog, uh, I wrote something on private social services. A lot of people have been contributing uh, URLs for private anarchist or libertarian mutual aid groups. Okay. But there's the regular ones that still exist. Private Financial for Lutherans. Um, it has over 1,400 local chapters. Modern Woodsmen of America is the third largest fraternal benefit uh, society in the United States with more than 760,000 members. And they provide all sorts of services to their members. Um, there are others, um, Knights of Columbus, Oddfellows, or the Brethren Mutual Aid Agency um, serving the needs of the Anabaptist communities. It's over 100 years old. So it's not like they completely went away, but the government has co-opted a lot of them. And these are the kind of groups we need to encourage. Uh, we need to support them, we need to volunteer, we need to encourage them in every way they can. They are the ones who give women, children, and men a hand up, not a hand out. The message that we need to bring to American women and men is one that says independence, personal responsibility, community projects, and mutual aid are the way to solve social problems, not government. Americans are generous people who can solve community problems with their minds to it. Government largesse has come too great a price, and we are, and our children are suffering because of it. Women and men don't need Big Brother, either psychologically or politically. It's time for a change. Um, how much time do we have for
questions? 59. Oh, okay. Yeah, back there. Um, well, I agree with a lot of what you said about um, uh, upholding the responsibility, the responsibility of the individual. Um, but I think uh, the you know idea of uh, like uh, child care regulations being a burden really pales in comparison to the fact that there are millions of girls who are being killed today just because um, of the fact that they are girls in the form of sex selective abortions and infanticide. And so it seems to me like have a government, that should be its role. I don't have a problem with that. I'm, I'm not here particularly interested in arguing for anarchism. I'm just talking about the way government uh, has harmed women. So we have, what, we have to have some system for protecting the rights of individuals. Absolutely. Um, what system might be best is a subject for another, another time. Oh, come on, there's got to be more questions. There's all kinds of topics I didn't cover. Yes. So, um, I'm happy again in case you didn't. Well, you probably know what the caveat towards teaching said. general answer. I'm not sure I followed all of that. Um, there are obviously a lot of people who are opposed to abortion, but there is a long um, tradition of jurisprudence that suggests when there is a large amount of disagreement in the populace, the most appropriate action is to take no action. If there is not a consensus, and there is not a consensus, on the issue of abortion. No one is forcing anyone to, to have abortions. If your religion suggests that abortion is wrong, that is your choice. But you do not have the right to force your religious views on others. And the vast majority of people who believe that abortion is murder do so for religious reasons 
and to advocate laws, A, goes against this long system of jurisprudence that says when there is not a consensus, have no laws. Number two, violates the separation of church and state. Um, now, as far as abortion safety, I, I think you may have raised that question. It's a lot more safe when it's legal than when it's illegal. I'm not sure I covered all of your questions, but I hope I covered some of it. Yes. Oh, wait a minute. You haven't asked a question yet. Um, then, then you. Uh, so I'm getting the, you know, the whole strong libertarian overtures, and I love it and all, but I'm really curious uh, how you, as a libertarian feminist, are different than libertarian Joe out there. Like, what does the libertarian well, feminism uh, bring to it well, in particular? Uh, did you, I, I talked about that at the beginning of the talk. We're against government power. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, uh, um, just the things that you stress when you talk no, about No, I, I suppose it's more. Well, we're generally wary of, uh, of government uh, help, quote unquote, because m most government help has unintended consequences, and most of the, uh, many of the unintended consequences are bad. Um, and also, we strongly believe that we don't have the right to impose our values on others. So, for instance, on the issue of pornography, whatever we as individuals think about pornography, um, we don't think we have the right to say there should be no, there should be laws against pornography. Um, there, uh, that's a whole kettle of worms. And actually, there are many non-libertarian feminists who take that position. Also, there's an organization which still exists called Fem Feminists for Free Speech. So you know, libertarian feminists are not the only ones that favor free speech. Um, Joan Kennedy Taylor was very active in that group. So. But all, there are feminists who think there should be laws against pornography because they claim pornography harms women. Although I must say, however we may feel about it, and I'm not like exactly a fan, but okay, um, the research does not suggest that. Okay. Um, it, it, that's a whole, whole issue in itself. But I mean, the main way libertarian feminists are different is we want to ask the government to help. We want to find other ways. I mean, I think that's the key thing that makes a libertarian feminist. Yeah. Well, um, I was oh. kind of thinking about um, maybe maybe he's kind of skimmed on it and I kind of missed it, but um, I'm kind of thinking about the, the foster care system, uh, children that are wards of the county or the state or whatever how you put it. Um, now I've heard of situations maybe you know more about it, of, in, in which that um, that foster families would actually take on kids, totally neglect them. We take on kids just for money, just for money from the state, because they're going to get paid. And also, there's the same situation. Um, a family, a woman in Section 8 housing, we're in, in, we're in the city here. Um, I'm pregnant. Um, I'm going to I'm going to have that kid because I'm going to get more welfare. I'm guaranteed my housing. I'm going to get more welfare for the kid. Um, so what? I mean, do you know anything more about like the the kind of kick? It's it's almost a kickback system. It's almost there are a lot of problems and. Um, yeah, I've heard lots of complaints about foster care also. And if it were in the hands of private uh, institutions that would more closely monitor um, the people involved, it would almost certainly be a lot safer for the kids. Um, what happens with the welfare and the attendant other services, it's such a huge bureaucracy Social workers are so overwhelmed. They have one of the highest burnout rates of any occupation. I think doctors have a high, wait, wait, <laughs> high burnout rate. Um, pardon? Yeah, uh, well, whatever. But social, <laughs> social welfare workers have a high burnout rate because they recognize how little they can help because they're, they're overwhelmed with the caseloads. Although, Okay, there has been welfare reform. In the 1990s, there was a welfare reform, reform with a big long name, I don't quite remember. But it did help a bit, but not enough. It did reduce caseloads because it started requiring things like putting a cap on welfare. What a concept! You know, and a lot of states have adopted that. Um, uh, many states have a cap of five years total lifetime. 
including California, but here's the catch. They can allow exceptions. Oh yeah, they weasel in around it. Okay. Another thing, there's a variety of provisions in the Welfare Reform Act that helped reduce the caseload, but it is not enough. It's not enough. It's still a mess. There's still not enough monitoring. Um, we know about lack of government monitoring around here, don't we? The case of that creep out in Contra Costa County that kept that poor woman in his backyard for how many years? That's, you know, that's what government monitoring is worth. And the way, if we have private organizations, small organizations that aren't getting half their money from government, then we have a better chance of having more monitoring of those kind of situations. And the private, what the private organizations do is say, you can't stay on welfare forever. We'll help you now, but you've got to go out and get a job. You've got to do this, you've got to do that. You can't, we're not going to give you a handout forever. And even though there's been welfare reform that reduces some of that, it's still not enough, and the state's going to weasel around. By the way, just for whatever it's worth, California ranks 13th in terms of its reforms. The state, the two states with the best welfare reforms is Idaho and Ohio. And some of the southern states are down at the bottom. The poor southern states are always at the bottom of every index. <laughs> and, yeah, you had a question. general statement, hey, I'm not a lawyer, so I didn't say it as well as a lawyer might. But um, that was a clear abridgment. Uh, and that, we, no slavery can be allowed to exist. So, yeah, there's some problems with that, but, uh, so, I, so I wouldn't certainly base my whole argument on that, I, but it was a point that others have made. Okay, I need to ask some new people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about Camille Polio? You know, that's an interesting question, and I've been asked that before, and I've never been able to finish reading one of her books. Well, how do you feel about her, like, ideology? Well, my feeling... Nor have I, for that matter, but Pardon? sorry. I said nor have I, for that matter, but sorry. You know, mixed feelings. On the one hand, hey, people will stir up the pot. I'm all for it. <laughs> okay? Even when I disagree with them, I think stirring up the pot is good because it gets people to think. But I'm not like a big fan of what I know. Not really. But, uh, she sensationalizes things too much. And I have a problem with that. Um, it's one thing to stir up the pot and another thing to say things for the sake of being extreme. But, you know, I haven't read a lot of her because I could never get into it. So I'm, I'm going to remain open-minded. If I read more of her, maybe I'd like her better. Okay. Back there. Um, yeah, so back to the human rights um, statement. So I'm, I'm pro-life, and I think probably the way I differ is not so much, because I'm also a limited government um, sort of person. And so I think, correct me if I'm wrong, if we just agree on a definition of because I think we both agree that the government should protect life. Um, that's one of the basic things government should do. So I'm just trying to figure out where we differ. Okay, on the issue of a person. By the way, I have an essay about independence of abortion on, at the Alpha website, although I'm planning on expanding that soon. The fetus does not fit any definition of abortion than any that psychologists or philosophers or law have ever used. It, it is not self-aware. It cannot make choices. It does not fit the definition of a person. That's the short answer. It simply does not. Um, by any definition,
recognition that has ever been given by people outside the pro-choice movement. It does not fit the definition of a person. What about biologists? So, well, I didn't mean to exclude them. <laughs> uh, I mean, obviously there's some difference of, of opinion, but philosophers and both philosophers and psychologists, and I suppose biologists too, in, in, in slightly different words, talk about the concept of choice and, co well, certainly psychologists talk about cognitive functioning. You can't have the cognitive function of a person until there's outside stimuli to form cognitions. But I think it really hinges on the fact that the fetus is not self-aware and cannot be said to make choices in any reasonable sense. Therefore, it does not fit the definition of a person. Well, um, we're just about out of time, and so um, to end on a lighter note, I was wondering, um, I, there, I know I see um, many of my acquaintances in this room who are objectivists or fans of Ayn Rand, and um, at dinner you told a very interesting story of an encounter you, an encounter you had right here at UC Berkeley on Straw Plaza with Ayn Rand, and I was wondering if you could recant that to put it close to the... Okay, students. by the way, I want to say one other thing, which I hope is on a lighter note. There is a libertarian feminist anthology in process, and I'm one of the editors, and all of these things I've talked about, and a good many more, like affirmative action, pay equity, and if you didn't even ask me about those, those are tough issues, all going to be in this anthology. And I'm working on it, and I'm, uh, there's a, a chance that Cato may sponsor it, well, if I do it right, and put it together right. A bunch of people have already agreed uh, to um, contribute. Um, Daruji, uh, Deirdre McCloskey, uh, let's see, who else names you might know? Susan Love Brown, uh, Steve Horwitz. How many of you know Steve Horwitz? By the way, if you're on Facebook, send me a friend invite. You say you heard, heard you, I told you you could send one to me, okay? Uh, I'm not the only Sharon Presley on Facebook, but you know, I'm the only one that looks like me. <laughs> So, um, a lot of people, are, Jim Perrin's in it, uh, a bunch of people are, are in this anthology. So, I want to say that. Okay, the story about Ayn Rand. Years ago, back before your parents were even born, boy, does this make me feel old, um, in 1966, well, at least you weren't born, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, Nathaniel Brandon, uh, was giving a uh, premiere in his, uh, uh, his uh, lect lecture series about romantic love, principles of romantic love. He premiered it in San Francisco. And he was there. Rand came out for the premiere. And she walked on campus. I guess maybe I had an inkling that it was going to happen because I w didn't fall out of my chair when she walked up to our table. Um, we had a button at that time. Now, I have to give you a little background to tell you that at that time, the um, governor of California was Governor Edmund T. Brown, father of the Bozo in Sacramento, who is currently <laughs> running the state. Anyway, <laughs> so he was often said, uh, there was, you know, a lot of people called him the socialist and so forth, and yeah, we didn't care. We had a button, it was a side gag, so it's not very funny to have me tell you about it. The left-hand side was colored brown, and the right-hand side was colored pink, and there was the word is in the middle. So if you read it, brown is pink. Rayanne thought that was wonderful. She loved that button. She thought it was very clever, so of course I gave her one. <laughs> I didn't even charge her for it. <laughs> Okay, do you want me to tell, you, tell them the rest of the story, or is that the main one? Oh, well, we're about low on time, but if you remember. Okay, well, then uh, I'll quickly. In, after the, um, the lecture series, I gave her a copy of the Berkeley Statement of the Alliance of Libertarian Actors. And that was when she was still friendly toward libertarian. She took it, she annotated it, and gave it back to me at the end of the lecture. And um, I'm going to have to
to dig out, well, actually, the time is doing I sold it to a collector for a lot of money. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have my own copy of it. I um, made a copy because it's pretty rare. Because as many of you know, she later had a less favorable impression of the tomb. All right, well, I have lots of other stories. You said there's going to be a social afterwards? Yeah. Absolutely. You can come to the social, and I'll tell you some more stories about birthdays. <laughs>